hello, everybody. You want to give a wave? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Tansei, uh, Aaron Marie, Netsigasun, uh, Manitou, Sagahiga, and Ochenia. Uh, my name is Aaron Marie, and I am from Laksainan, uh, Alberta. I'm uh, Metis Cree. And I'm also uh, the Media Arts Justice and Projects Coordinator at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network. And we're so excited to be on this webinar today with um, our Indigenous Young Women's National Council, uh, a very important and near project to our hearts at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network. Uh, and we're also very happy and honored to be uh, invited here by the I Don't Know More series um, to talk about a very important subject matter um, that's also near and dear to our hearts and our work uh, at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, um, that of addressing uh, colonial, ge colonial gender-based violence and doing that through uh, self-governance uh, through our bodies and also through our communities. Uh, so before we get started and move into this webinar, I'm just going to go over a couple logistics for ways that you can interact as folks that are tuned in live. Um, and so, uh, as you might have seen, there's a Facebook page uh, for today. The Facebook page is Self Governance for Our Bodies uh, and Communities Responding to Colonial Gender Based Violence. So, you can feel free to add in questions uh, into that Facebook event and we'll answer them at the end. So, as questions come up, feel free to post them there. You can also post them on the YouTube link uh, in the comments section and we'll be monitoring that as well. You can also uh, tag us on Twitter, so you can tag at IndigenousYW on Twitter to ask questions of this webinar, ask questions of the council members as they present, and we will make sure that those are addressed as well. Uh, so uh, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in live. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Um, we're really honored to have been invited by the Idle No More series. And let's rock and roll. So first off, uh, we just want to give some background on the Native Youth Sexual Health Network and who we are. So we're just going to pull up the first slide about who we are. Um, so Spencer, can you just pull up that? Oh, awesome. So just to go over who we are, uh, the Native Youth Sexual Health Network is a by and for Indigenous youth organization, and we work around the full spectrum of sexual and reproductive health rights and justice, uh, or also what we uh, often refer to as the, our lands and our bodies as Indigenous people. So we don't see a separation between um, the land and also what's happening on our bodies, and it's also important um, simultaneously for us to be addressing not only health and rights as Indigenous peoples related to our bodies, but also justice. And um, importantly, and I think for today, um, peer-led responses to gender-based violence are also at the center of what we do at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network. Uh, and the Indigenous Young Women's Council members who are going to be speaking today are a very clear example of that, of peer-led responses to things that are happening to our bodies and to our communities as Indigenous peoples. So I'm just going to give a little bit of background about the Indigenous Young Women's Council and how it's come to be. So um, the Native Youth Sexual Health Network is in partnership with the Girls, with Girls Action Foundation um, for the Indigenous Young Women Speaking Our Truths, Building Our Strengths National Project. And this project and council is a peer advisory uh, made up of 10 uh, Indigenous uh, young women that is co coordinated by Nishin directly. And the project focuses on um, Indigenous young women's leadership, empowerment, solidarity building, um, and ending violence. Um, and it does that through uh, reclamation of culture and resurgence as Indigenous nations and peoples. And um, Importantly as well, um, the council is made up of uh, Indigenous young women between the ages of 16 to uh, 29, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit um, people, and those who also identify as women, trans, two-spirit, uh, or gender non-conforming um, are also a part of our council. Um, and the council came together um, really as 
a response to needing an indigenous uh, young women led response to several different issues that were happening in our communities um, and the network has just been uh, a support in the background to um, uh, provide space and a platform for uh, young people to be doing uh, work in their communities and one of the first actions that the council worked towards in 2011 was putting together the the first and only of its kind lion for uh, Indigenous young women led uh, gathering so we had 70 uh, uh, Indigenous self-identified Indigenous young women uh, and two-spirit people as well as um, importantly our mentors and our elders that came and joined us in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and from there, it's uh, resulted in a series of uh, community actions um, that it, the leaders on this national advisory have led in their communities. And that's really a model that we always try and support at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, is supporting the work that young people do every single day in their lives, and also supporting um, what may be seen as unconventional leadership. So that can be young people uh, providing harm reduction supplies to their friends and community, um, sharing knowledge about the ways that we can protect our bodies, uh, taking care of each other on the streets if that's where we exist as young people, um, providing you know spaces for us to talk about how uh, state-based legislation also creates violence on our bodies. So it's really just been about um, providing spaces to elevate the work that Indigenous youth and young women are doing every single day day in their life and sometimes that's really unconventional and sometimes it's more formal um, and so this council has been really great in terms of um, responding to issues uh, that they'll be going over today anything from the issue of missing and murdered indigenous young women and girls and two-spirit people um, to restoring rites of passage to addressing environmental violence and any other number of things as well uh, so what I'm going to do is first just break down a little bit uh, behind the title of today's webinar. Um, so if you can pull up the next slide on colonial gender-based violence. So the in the title of the event, um, we chose to use the word uh, colonial gender-based violence, and that's really purposeful for setting the context of this discussion. Uh, so at, at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network and also in the work of the Indigenous Young Women's National Council, addressing colonial gender-based violence is something that um, we're seeing young people take up. And that term itself, um, you know, I think is important for us to break down. And so in the beginning, it says colonial, and then I think if you break it into the second part, gender-based violence, it really names right off from the bat that the gender-based violence that Indigenous peoples, Indigenous youth, and Indigenous young women face is different than that of non-Indigenous peoples. So it has that colonial legacy um, that, make, that sets up very specific experiences of violence um, in our lives, on our bodies, and in our communities. And some of those structures of, of, of colonial gender-based violence come from um, structures such as state government. So the very existence of Canada and the US are systems of colonialism that actually increase gender-based violence uh, because they aren't our own. They, those governments don't come from um, our indigenous nations. Um, other uh, forms of colonial gender-based violence can be uh, examples such as the foster care system and the child welfare system, um, the very existence of prisons, um, which you know are overrepresented um, by indigenous peoples as well as social services so um, you know we wanted to have a conversation today led by our uh, council members um, on our national council about some of the ways that they're seeing colonial gender-based violence appear in their lives in the young people around them as well as their communities um, but even more importantly not only to talk about you know all of those some of those shitty things that are happening in our lives as young people um, and some of those experiences of violence but what we can do to support each other as young people um, and doing that through culture and resurgence of uh, self-governance over our bodies and over our lands and or in our communities so uh, for today we're gonna do um, we're gonna have three of our indigenous uh, council members present on what uh, self-governance means to them, 
what colonial gender-based violence means to them, and the ways that they're resisting and challenging that violence um, on their bodies, uh, in their communities, and doing that through uh, strength-based approaches. So we're, without further ado, um, I don't want to take up any more space, and I want to hand it over to um, one of our amazing staff at the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, who's going to go over some of the ways in which uh, gender-based violence uh, appears in our work, just to set a context uh, for um, our, our youth council members to um, build off of. So I'm going to hand it over to Alexa. Well, thanks, Erin. So, um, Buju, Ms. Nakaz, Makwando Dem, Noktuminguaning Donji. So, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alexa. My spirit name, Misabekwe, translates um, to many things. The most um, the most commonly referred or translated version is Great Spirit Woman. Um, I'm from the Bear Clan, and I'm also from um, a reserve in northwestern Ontario called Whitefish Bay. Um, so, and just and just starting off, um, uh, and and being really real and honest about um, colonial gender-based violence, these these were conversations that we were having, you know, just just a couple days ago, and conversations we've been having about, you know, in our in our like all throughout our lives. But I just even even those words, like in all honesty, they were something that were a little bit confusing to me because I felt like I couldn't I couldn't break those words down. Um, and then when I actually started thinking about how how colonial gender-based violence was for real something affecting um, my family, myself, and my communities, um, it, it became more clear. And so the, how I how I first understood it, and how I think it's it's sometimes helpful to understand it, is that um, the the violence that the gender the colonial gender-based violence that we experience it first started. Um, and was perpetrated against um, our mother, so our first, our very first mother, which was the Earth. Um, and I think that's a very important violence, um, or not important. That's important to acknowledge that that violence um, and the violence that happens to our Earth. So, like, what, I, what I'm referring to is extractive industries like logging, mining, um, and all of those things. So that violence um, was directly linked to how Indigenous people would be treated in that area as well. Um, and acknowledging that um, colonialism and the way um, the way the way it works and the way colonialism is su successful is first by um, is first by breaking down those roles and those teachings and the importance that two spirit and young and women in our cultures have. Um, because something that's very different about the violence that's ex that's that's perpetrated um, for women and two-spirit people is that those, both of those people, um, you know, um, sorry, I'm in the, in the picture, um, um, are the carriers of the culture, they're, car they're the life givers of the nation, the actual very literal nation makers. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that that violence, you know, it's not something that's new. Um, it's something that's been happening to our land for a long time, and a lot of things, and it's been happening to our communities. Very deliberate erasure of the importance we had in our communities. Um, also, wanting to acknowledge that um, gen colonial gender-based violence, it has it has many many forms. Um, Sometimes it's easier for me to think about it in terms of like trickster and like all of the many faces and ways that um, trickster appears. Um, and so colonial gender-based violence is um, is the state, um, you know, taking children away from their homes, whether that was you know the child welfare system, the 60s scoop, or um, residential schools, or or even just when young Indigenous people have to move away from their homes to get access to supplies or education or um, resources that deliberate removal of children and breaking down of family and um, rooting into our communities hate more hate than and violence than love and um, breaking down and pulling up those roots that we had um, you know being connected to our ancestors being connected to our knowledge um, colonial gender-based violence also you know that's that's violence by the state, that's violence in the prison systems, and that these systems are even in place or that they're created. Um, and I think it's important that um, we don't have the choice and we don't have the privilege to not address all of the, all of the very real um, violence happening in our lives. Whether that's, you know, if that's coming from the state, which is, you know, something that we really have to deal with a lot, or it's coming from our communities, um, as, 
um, or you know it's lateral wherever that violence is coming from that we can't we can't address all of the things that are happening to our lives and our bodies um, because that's not that's not a privilege that we have um, oh yeah and then uh, Shane next slide there's Spencer sorry <clears throat> um, can I um, and so talking about, so I mean, there is a lot of, you know, fucked up shittiness in our lives and some examples of the ways that we um, respond. Um, this, the image that should be pulled up now is what are some of the ways that we respond. So, um, sorry, can I just... I'm just yeah, gonna, okay, so I just want to see the slide. Um, so this image that you see on the screen, um, so this image it was art done by our awesome Aaron. Um, and so the picture it says, "Whispers of the truth of our history come back as screams through the ancestral voices of our youth." And so what that means is that um, youth um, and their um, and their roles in communities um, are really are very important and they're vital. And it's because our ancestors um, they speak through us. And they speak through us through a lot of different ways. Um, and so that's, this, this image is really embodying of how we respond. How we respond is that we, we are the bridges between our ancestors and what, what's going to be happening you know, to people that are ahead of us or to our families or to our brothers or our sisters. We're that bridge. Um, and it's really important for our communities. And also acknowledging that, um, that um, the ways that we respond right, are very are very diverse and very and very different, and they have to be um, because, like I had mentioned earlier, our, all of our realities um, need to be addressed. Um, we can't we can't leave things out, right? We can't talk about missing and murdered Indigenous women or, or young people without talking about continued land theft or the extractive resources and and mining companies that are in our communities. We can't um, we can't fracture those or um, not ha talk about those simultaneously. Um, and so next slide, please. So <clears throat> one of the one of the very concrete ways that you know we address colonial gender-based violence um, is by reclaiming rites of passage and coming of age ceremonies. So lots of different nations across across this country um, have had rites of passage ceremonies. So rites of passage is when you're transitioning from one life stage to another. So you know that's Rites of passage happens when you're born. It happens when you're a young person or when you're an elder. And so, something that the the Native Youth Sexual Health Network has been doing um, is helping to reclaim and restore some of those um, coming of age ceremonies. So that's that's happened in Akwesasne, um, Ohologo under the husk. So um, this is also something that we're restoring in Treaty Three, Northwestern Ontario. And so, how how rites of passage. Um, um, responds to colonial gender-based violence is that we celebrate young people and we prepare them for really important things that they're going to be doing in their lives. We support the gifts, the natural gifts that they have been given. Um, we understand them as Indigenous people, right? We make space for them to identify um, who they are, what they need, and, and who they want to be. Um, and it's also about um, restoring and reclaiming some of those knowledge and teachings that were forcefully taken away from us and things that helped that helped ground us like ceremony and how those things were taken away and, and rites of passage is a, is a really concrete example of how we, we bring up young people from a very young age um, to help to help them to help support their very natural gifts. Um, so next slide. Um, another next slide please. Another concrete example of how we address um, colonial gender-based violence is by providing culturally safe supports. And um, what I mean by that is providing supports that are accessible and make sense to us and aren't about labeling us at, at risk or in need of saving. Um, so the Sexy Health Carnival is something that um, I had actually created in my community. Um, and it was <laughs> something that I had created yeah. in my community um, as a need, right? I saw that young, the way that young people were being talked at and talked to was very, was very shaming and making, already adding to the shame and violence that um, was happening in our lives and in my life. And so some, that was something I created with the intention um, to help um, our communities and my, even just my family understand um, you know, the, the way, um, the way consent works, um, about contraceptives, about how, about, about how the land can teach us about healthy relationships, um, because it can, and so the Sexy Health Carnival, um, 
for those of you who don't know, is a series of, of booths and um, activities um, that are just are just meant to help make learning about our bodies um, not shaming and done in a very accessible way, um, in ways that make sense to us, right? Like using very accessible words, using or playing games and learning together, um, you know, at powwows, at in communities, in schools, in our in our lodges, right? The the sexy health carnival comes to all spaces. Um, and um, in terms of the, you might see on the left-hand side the picture, the land can teach us about healthy relationships. And that's also, like, just even talking about that, that's a very concrete way um, that, um, that you address colonial gender-based violence. And even just making the connections that the land can teach us about healthy relationships, right? That that was, that was something that we learned from the land and that, and that our land and that the land and the earth, like, has been our teacher since since the beginning, um, and it's important to acknowledge that. So what I mean when I say the land can teach us about healthy relationships is that in the same way that relationships need to be reciprocal, right, and you need, there needs to be respect, so in the same way that I put my tobacco down when I take cedar or when I hunt animals, um, the same way that the, the earth is giving back to me, I need to give back too. So I say I put my tobacco down, I give thanks, um, and it's also about acknowledging the many relationships we have, right? So the earth, um, the earth itself, our mother earth, has relationships to literally everything. It has relationships to the spirits of the rocks, of trees, of animals, of all all ecosystems, even just on our on our earth, and how that our relationships are many, and that it's not, for example, just talking about healthy relationships. Healthy relationships happens to the land. It, it happens with the land. It happens to our family members, um, and that. That's something that, that hasn't been lost, right? So the the even just the so the land can teach us about healthy relationships. That's acknowledging that healthy relationships, like that's that that's still something that we have in our communities and something that's still that still can happen. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, which Aaron could probably speak to a lot better than I could, um, is the project that was being done. Um, in Edmonton, it was called Empowering Ourselves, which was where Indigenous youth um, were understanding structural violence using media arts justice. So every um, two weeks, um, Indigenous youth from across, you know, in Edmonton would come, come together and and specifically address um, ways that state perpetrates violence. So that was um, done every week. And so this this picture here, um, the the what they had been addressing that. Um, that week was um, environmental violence and the ways um, that we respond to that. So Empower Ourselves done in Edmonton was a great way to speak back to how we want to tell our stories, right? How we, how we need to be the people telling our stories because we are the experts of our lives and our bodies and our experiences. Hmm. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um... So rolling right along, uh, we now have the great honor of having some of our council members from the National Indigenous Young Women's Council speak to us a little bit about what self-governance over their bodies and their communities looks like to them, uh, what colonial gender-based violence looks like in their, in their communities and how they're responding. Uh, before we go into that, I'm just going to... Uh, have a couple of reminders for people that are tuned in live. You can leave questions on Twitter for us or for the council members uh, by just uh, sending questions on Twitter at IndigenousYW, so that's short for Indigenous Young Women. So once again, it's just the at sign and then Indigenous capital YW. You can also leave questions and comments on the Facebook event page for us, as well as the council members that we can answer at the end. As well as on the YouTube uh, channel, you can leave comments in the comment section. So we encourage you to uh, reach out and join us in this conversation by interacting that way. Uh, so I'm gonna. We have three council members that are joining us today to speak about their work uh, in addressing colonial gender-based violence uh, through self-governance. We're gonna have uh, Megan and Kirsten and Melody. Um, and so Kirsten is our first council member up, so I'll ask that uh, Spencer pull up Kirsten. And Kirsten, I will hand it over to you. Okay, great. Tanse Natsigasen, Kirsten Linquist, Nia Nahio, Machif Nia Otsi Elk Point. 
Hello everyone, I'm Kirsten Linquist. I'm a Cree woman and I'm from around Elk Point, Alberta. It's in northeast Alberta. I'm a Métis, a proud Métis Indigenous feminist and I'm currently working on my Master of Arts in Indigenous Governance. So I'm in the thick of my community governance project. So I was in Victoria for a year and now I've moved back home, returned to rural northeast Alberta and I'm working with a school, uh, engaging with Nahio Cree high school students uh, at a public school, uh, which is literally down by the river. So if you're thinking rural, this is this is rural. And we're working on media arts-based approaches to learning skills, sharing skills, and youth community engagement and leadership. And um, it's, I used to be really big on Twitter, but uh, there's not a lot of reception down by the school. And according to my students, Twitter is for old people. So I'm kind of, uh, you know, working with the students where they're at. And, you know, I have to use more Instagram examples because they're not, they're not into Twitter. So there's, those are the things we kind of change when we do our projects. Uh, so I see and also experience colonial gender-based violence in rural areas and how it's embedded in the education system. So colonial gender binaries are enforced in both overt and subtle ways. There hasn't been much engagement about gender and sexualities in addition to a lack of work around languages for two-spirit people in rural areas and the school system. So there's still a common fear of discussing sexual education, sexualities, gender, and relationships with young people in the education system. So uh, like what Alexa was talking about, I'm hopefully slowly going to be able to do some engagement with the students, do some workshops with that's kind of navigating the space in the school system. So some advocate for homeschooling, but this isn't a possibility for all students with working parents or guardians. And while I envision a culturally safe and land-based learning network for the communities in my area, we need to support youth who are on the front line every day challenging colonial education and colonial gender-based violence. And so from having to mark off school forms like checkboxes, male or female, and then having to check off single, married or divorced in university applications are small ways in which the education system is an extension of settler colonial policies that polices gender, sexualities, and relationship. And I may be single because of the box, but I'm part of this rad indigenous feminist hide tanning collective that you should be watching out for. It's coming. It's going to be awesome. And this is the kind of thing that we need to talk about in terms of relationships. So back to the education system, are we learning social justice in social studies? I'm not sure. Are we learning about the more than 1,200 missing and murdered Indigenous women in social studies? I don't know. When I was in social studies, we were still learning about Adam Smith, the invisible hand in capitalism. So I think there's a disconnect, especially for Indigenous students in the public school system, that there's not that safe space to talk about what's happening in the communities. And I don't know how, to what degree, if the teachers are prepared to have these discussions. So I don't teach social studies, but I'm committed to co-creating safe space in the room that I share with the students. The home ec room, I was raised in a home ec room uh, all my life. My mom was a home ec teacher and a sex ed teacher. So that was a really interesting experience when your mother is teaching you uh, sex ed with, you know, small town kids. So yeah, so I'm now kind of fulfilling that role in a different way and engaging with the youth uh, whether through activities or lunchtime and I've found the support and resources from Native Youth Sexual Health Network incredibly useful in addition to the inspirational work from my fellow IYW uh, council members. So in the context of working with youth in schools, uh, self-governance for our bodies is taking the time and creating the space to be in bodies. So during school we it's highly regulated, we go from one class to the other, um, this high stress, um, we need to take time to understand what are, are our bodies in the classroom, how can Indigenous students reclaim space in the classroom for peer-to-peer -peer support and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, this means constantly addressing consent over and over again and addressing relationships with each other. So, for example, we are working uh, with the students I'm working with on a group agreement um, and for the room and for the relationships in it, uh, 
so how do we want to learn and participate in activities? Um, how do we want to govern ourselves in this very specific community setting? Um, and we can plan to continuously check in to see how we're feeling. And so this is more of like a, a strength-based approach that Alexa is talking about in terms of approaching our ways and forming different communities in the time and space that we have to be in the, in the school system and also approaching it from a no stigma and no shame perspective. So I kind of, as, because, you know, I'm on Twitter, the students think I'm a weirdo, so I kind of have that, like, weird anti anti role. So, like, the good thing about weird aunties is that people aren't afraid to ask weird questions, so I'm, I'm kind of, like, the go-to person, and that's that's kind of the role that I've, I'm, I'm adjusting right now. And, like, I always make sure there's hot chocolate, coffee, and tea in my room, because sometimes you just need to sit down and just have a moment because school is stressful and it doesn't always you know, facilitate the best of relationships between students if they're stressed or if they're overly disciplined, um, highly anxious space. So I think if we can make safe space, then we can start to have the discussions about connecting our bodies to kids. And then uh, I try to get outside a lot for some of the activities I do. So there's a couple cameras for uh, the photography media project that we're working on. And so students have the ability to kind of go outside, take a breather, and use that, that camera as a way to use, uh, it's called the youth, the youth lens. So like we're looking through the lens from youth perspective. And um, so far I've just learned so much from the amazing students that I I work with and you, you have safe space. Um, there's just so many amazing things that happen. Uh, like one student can sit down and play Beethoven and another one knows how to sing. So it's just making these spaces available for students to look and be confident in their abilities and then that helps form strong relationships that they're supporting each other and then addressing uh, colonial gender-based violence. And I, I do want to see a a prairie-based, land-based education school. I also want to have a resurgent RV, like media-based resurgence RV, where we travel the prairies with an RV full of harm reduction supplies, art supplies. It could be called MARV, the media resurgence RV MARV. So look out for MARV as well. So I, um, in addition for the Indigenous Young Women's Council activities, uh, I'm planning to work with another Métis young woman who taught me how to bead. Uh, she's, she actually made these earrings, and, and she's an inspirational woman, and we're, we're planning a youth moccasin-making workshop and talking about reciprocal relationships in regards to how traditionally that was happening and then how can we bring those traditions and values into our relationships today and then kind of having, having that fun uh, connection to the land how we get our moccasin materials, and so I'm really excited about that. So that's basically what I've been working on right now. Um, I will pass it on to the next person. Awesome. Uh, so thank you, Kirsten, for sharing about your work, uh, for getting us all excited about the possibility of the rural RV. I know I'm really excited about that, about being able to just bring harm reduction to our communities in rural areas, that's, a, I think, a really real way of taking care of each other as young people. Um, so thank you for sharing about your work. We're going to pull up um, Melody, who is in person in this trio here. Um, we're all together. So uh, Melody will be sharing um, their work next. So without any further ado, passing it over. Bojo, Maldi Makaver Jagan Shimo and Indishnikaz, Obishkapong, Women to Goji with Tigwang and Donjiba, Makwana no dem, Anishnabe Kwendi Shimanadwa Dinda. My name is Maldi Makaver, and uh, my family's uh, traditional territory is in uh, Laxal First Nation, which is in northwestern Ontario, Treaty 3 territory. Uh, but I currently live and work in Ottawa, though I'm here in Toronto right now, and Toronto is kind of my second home where I also do a lot of work. Um, I'm primarily a musician and media artist, but uh, in Ottawa I also do a lot of uh, community organizing and uh, programming around Two-Spirit issues, as well as on the, the national level with uh, 
the Indigenous Young Women's Project. And um, uh, I wanted to uh, try and break down the, the ways that uh, colonial gender-based violence uh, will uh, does like very particularly uh, impact uh, two spirit people because um, foremost, like I find um, maybe I should uh, back up and explain uh, uh, what I mean by uh, by two spirit identity. It's um, it, it's a relatively recent term in English. It comes from uh, organizing uh, dating back to about 1990 with uh, international. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, gatherings of uh, uh, indigenous uh, people who are uh, who also identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, gender non-conforming, uh, like a wide variety of uh, gender and sexual I identities. And Two Spirits uh, comes out of uh, Anishinaabe Moan uh, translation of Nij Manadawag, which uh, uh, Nij being two, Manadawag being spirits. Uh, so it is it's a term that's coming from an indigenous language, but with the intention that it's not uh, an Anishinaabe specific concept, but that can relate to indigenous people a bit more broadly. But of course, uh, our own indigenous nations have uh, uh, respective uh, teachings within two spirit frameworks, and uh, the, these teachings are there. They vary from nation to nation, but what we have seen in the process of colonialism through uh, through residential school, like my grandmother went to, through the 60s scoop, like my mother is a survivor of. Um, these are colonial tactics which have uh, very uh, specifically disrupted the transmission of knowledge within our communities. And uh, so uh, looking back at how residential schools were organized, they were very much gender-based, where uh, boys would be living and working together in one uh, one area and girls would be living and working together in another. And uh, I think there's still a lot of research and storytelling to be told on uh, what happened to these youth that were too spirit and uh, and put into these schools and uh, what happened if there was like a young trans woman that was then forced into the boys' dormitory. Like, I think there's a lot of these stories that we've yet to hear. And um, I spent the last, last week on a, a national uh, forum uh, dealing with two spirit issues in regards to the reconciliation. Uh, uh, in regards to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how uh, there's been an intergenerational impact uh, uh, in the fallout, fallout of residential schools. And having also uh, really personally experienced 60 Scoop within my family, we see that residential schools can also be sort of held up as like the, the sole uh, factor uh, impacting Indigenous communities, but colonialism is a much broader and a longer standing project than uh, than solely the residential schools as large and devastating an impact as those particularly had. And uh, so what we're seeing in response right now, because um, uh, often people look to more organizational sort of strategies like, oh, is there a two-spirit organization doing programming here? But uh, speaking as a youth, like I've found that often we manage to find our own uh, communities and really look out for each other in a, in a multiple of ways. And uh, in my own professional work as an artist, like sometimes I'll step back and realize that all of the artists I've been collaborating with over the past year, the majority of them are two-spirited. And it's not even like a cultivated, like we're doing art based on two-spirit identity, but like just, but as a testament to just how organically these, uh, these networks form, because um, uh, I think, Given the the amount of state attempts that there have been to really rupture and fra uh, fragment two spirit identity, uh, the resurgence that we're seeing right now is people step forward and claim these identities and uh, and look at their responsibilities in way of uh, create uh, creatively reestablishing our roles in our communities. We're uh, we're really pulled together and uh, creating these networks in organic ways where it might be. Uh, not within an organizational structure, but a number of people getting together for coffee and uh, or any number of uh, ways that communities are forming. And but uh, the ongoing challenges, and as I mentioned, uh, residential schooling and sixty scooping two really uh, large mitigating factors is currently in the Ottawa Two Spirit organizing. We're really trying to build a larger community and get to know each other because there's. A little pockets of existing circles of friends, and we're all trying to uh, reach across and uh, and uh, form a, a larger two-spirit community in Ottawa. And 
uh, the the one overarching uh, question is that we don't have we don't know of any elders within the Ottawa area, and and I should note that Ottawa is a very diasporic community. We're situated on Algonquin territory and living close to Mohawk territories as well, so there's a lot of shared relations there. But because it's uh, uh, such a large center for for jobs and employment, there is a lot of in migration from different uh, uh, indigenous communities. So we see a pretty uh, diverse urban indigenous population there. Uh, but within that, uh, there there are no self-identified two-spirit elders that our community is currently reaching out and accessing. And I hear these similar stories happening in a lot of other communities too. So I think that really speaks to um, the the prolonged and sustained violences that two-spirited people uh, have faced where uh, in a city as large as Ottawa, which I think has about 30,000 Indigenous peoples living within the urban boundary, um, there's no visible community presence of uh, elders for support and uh, so much of indigenous communities is based on intergenerational translation of knowledge and uh, we look to our uh, elders for guidance and so what is happening instead is a lot of uh, youth I think are stepping into these roles in creative ways and trying to reinterpret our tr uh, traditions on our own and uh, make uh, and frame two-spirit identity in a way that makes sense for us given our uh, uh, our diverse lived experiences, uh, but at the same time, uh, there still needs to be um, a, a flow of knowledge in both ways, as a lot of elders, especially those that have lived through the residential school uh, experience where there were very harmful colonial teachings around genders, uh, might not be understanding how youth are communicating what a two-spirit identity is. So. They're also looking at us uh, to explain to them how we are reinterpreting our teachings and uh, maybe critically engaging with uh, teachings that are coming out of Indigenous communities that we think are harmful to Two-Spirit people and doing some harm reduction around that to find ways of Two-Spirit people having uh, the best way to self-determine how we engage in our communities and find our own roles, whether that be uh, through fire keeping or picking medicines or or singing or dancing or any number of ways of community engagement of looking after each other um, and I think there's yeah there's a lot of community organizing that always happens that often flies beneath the radars especially given like the number of social and economic disadvantages that disproportionately affect two-spirited people that's um, we don't always have access to the institutional resources, but that doesn't stop the work from happening. Which, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, from Melody, for for sharing those important teachings with us. I think that's a a really important reminder of why we need. I know you're sitting right beside me here. <laughs> like it's a a really important reminder of why it's so important for um, two spirit people to to be a part of our circle. Um, to quote the Alex Wilson, um, uh, and why that's so important and connected to uh, rebuilding self-governance in our community, that part of self-governance um, for our bodies and our communities is having, um, you know, supporting two-spirit youth in our communities as well. So I think that's a really important part to this conversation. Um, to kind of roll up on the rest of our council members speaking, um, our final speaker for today from our National Council is Megan. Um, so I'm just going to encourage people, once again, tweet at us at IndigenousYW if you have questions, or you can post questions or comments in the Facebook event page as well. Uh, and I just encourage you to send some love this way to mm -hmm. all of our um, brave council members um, sharing all of their hearts and their stories and the work that they do every single day. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Megan. Yeah, well, um, so I'll just wait for myself to come up here. <laughs> okay, so Megan Gunnard at the Howie White Ujet. Um, my name is Megan Gunnard at the Howie White. I'm from Mohawk First Nations Territory in Quebec. I'm also Turtle Clan. Um, right now, I work as an attachment therapist for young children and young parents. Uh, for those of you who don't know what attachment is, it's a, a psychological perspective on how we raise our children and how we teach um, young parents to connect to their children and learn how to uh, normalize their emotions and, and find a new way to connect in, in ways that we're not really seeing happening today. 
Um, I'm also an artist and an art educator, so I, I work through the sphere as art. For me, um, taking an art space approach to any youth initiative is really important. I think it's very important to just acknowledge that not everybody is a speaker. Not everybody can sit down and have a dialogue. Sometimes that's scary. Sometimes that's stressful. I know that was like that for myself for a very long time. And it's really important to find out what other languages there are out there. So languages including visual art, including dance, music, sports, physical activity. There's all kinds of ways that you speak. So that's what, what's what I like to adhere to is just people's visual ways of, of thinking. Um, so for myself, colonial gender-based violence I think stems from just the difference in, in colonial structures. For instance, colonial structures for myself are very patriarchal and in my um, culture we come from a matriarchal place where women and men have equal responsibilities and equal roles and each role is, is respected and honored and man isn't more important than a woman or woman isn't more important than man, we need to work together. Um, it's also in a place where women are the center, like Alexa was saying earlier, that women are, are natural life givers to our nation and that's a role that's always worth honoring and respecting. And that our societies are not based on power relations or capitalism. It's, it's based on our relationships to each other. It's relationships between men, women, all genders. It's relationships to the environment. to the land patriarchal structures we have today through justice systems, through governments, it's a very different hierarchy um, that we have and I think a lot of the assimilation tactics are that are coming from this is based in fear and just fear of how different societies work. Um, so that comes through different assimilation techniques and trying to overpower our own structures through the Indian Act, through res residential schools and and more commonly, but uncommonly known, is just like the, the labels and the stereotypes that appear in, in social media and through, for instance, Halloween costumes and our Pocahontas and our Chief Wants Some Tales. And it sounds all funny, but um, they actually have really strong effects on just how indigenous women are viewed or how um, we view ourselves and, and how these labels and stereotypes just kind of um, not force us, but we sometimes we feel we need to become those stereotypes in order to understand who we are as indigenous people. So that's sort of the effects that I'm seeing in my community and just other spaces about how colonial gender-based violence appears is these labels, these techniques of assimilation dehumanize our women. It, it reduces us into these caricatures and they're hard to move out of without losing that identity to the outside. It, it's made us into objects or people that need to be in constant need of saving and of, after years of this happening through different generations um, we've learned to internalize it and the outside communities have learned to internalize that as well. It's a generational experience that's happening and it's normalizing these perceptions of what indigenous people are and what indige indigenous women are. Um, <clears throat> And what I find what's happening for our young people is that there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of loss of identity because they have these caricatures of what indigenous people are. There's these basic understandings of what being native is and, and it's very difficult to protect that identity without really knowing what's at the source of it. And there's just this animosity and this violence that appears both within and outside community because everybody's trying to understand what it means to be indigenous and for myself self-governance um, over our bodies and in our communities is one way to address that and to also understand that violence prevention is not just about looking to the systems and, and providing resources but it's also a decolonization process of what violence prevention is and looking at just uh, on a grassroots and individual level that self-governance over the body is about taking ownership of ourselves, it's about reflecting and respecting our own boundaries and, and learning to not need to apologize for setting those boundaries or saying no or not giving consent over your bodies, over the environment, over whatever you feel is, is part of yourself. And from 
this perspective, it, it empowers our young people, it gives them new ways and pathways to explore their own identity, and it gives you space to reconnect to your identity and culture and, and reclaim those teachings so we can fill those spaces of identity that we're trying to find between the stereotypes and just grasps of what we know and what our parents knew. And for myself, coming from a, a developmental psychology background and, and arts-based practice, um, what I do is I work with young parents um, with attachment techniques and, and perspectives, but combining it with rites of passage ceremonies and seeing that what researchers, show, what researchers are showing now is actually what we've been doing for centuries. And it's really important to, to layer that for our young people so that they're able to see through this perspective they've grown up with, but then to also bring that traditional knowledge to them. And the basis of it is how do we reestablish this connection that was broke, that was broken from residential schools that was taken away and how do we normalize our, our own emotions that we're, we're feeling and how do we not um, internalize that in unhealthy ways and I think that's really important to, to start taking our traditional teachings and giving that to our young children um, and to our youth that are growing up because if we don't give those teachings if we don't share those conversations then we'll be learning all of these teachings about the body from the media, from pornography, which is so easy to access nowadays. So it's important to just dissect and deconstruct what it means to be sexual, what it means to have a sexual identity. Um, and through specific projects, like I said, I, I'm doing work with young parents through rites of passage and using attachment um, therapy approaches. Um, but also I do a lot of cultural appropriation um, campaigns with the Ganawage Youth Forum which basically empowers youth to use social media to look at ways that our own identities are appropriated and what that means and how that in impacts our own identities and how that influences us and teaches the outside communities about what we are. Um, through the uh, Indigenous Young Women's Council I'm also doing a project that uses traditional storytelling and our, our legends and ceremonies to create a space for young people to talk about teachings they're learning through the stories and to create art about it and to reflect about um, our sexualities and our relations because all of our knowledge is in our ceremonies, it's in our creation story and, and when, we give these not, when we give this knowledge back to our young people it's so empowering for them to to have a real space to be and and for instance our creation story of Sky Woman when we have our we talk to our young women who are getting their moon times or their periods for the first time it's a recreation of that process of Sky Woman creating the earth and it's such a beautiful image for them to, to be so empowered that they they are just as important as the creation and for me the the goal of addressing colonial gender-based violence through self-governance is just to unlearn those colonial ways of dealing with life and to relearn what it means to listen because we've been taught that children need to be silenced and I think it's time to just find spaces so that we can learn to listen because that's what's going to help heal our communities. That's my spiel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Megan. You rocked it. Always bringing back the important representation that we have in our own bodies. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And I think, you know, relating it back to our creation stories and where we start from in our nations, such an important reminder. Uh, so we have, um, that was our council members. We have a couple of questions that have come up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of a funny one for you, Kirsten. So there is a question about uh, what is the poster on the jacket behind you? So do you just want to read out the poster, Kirsten, with and maybe explain what it means? Okay. <laughs> so I'm. This is uh, Diana, <laughs> and I'm making a gender fabulous warrior vest. So there's going to be some eating. This is part of my project, my skill sharing with my students. And this poster is uh, a Native Youth Sexual Health Network poster. It's uh, Indigenous feminists are too sexy for your heteropatriarchal 
settler colonialism. And I'm I'm gonna like you know weird anti embroider this on the back of the vest. So <laughs> I'm hoping I'm hoping to have a lot of these done for the new year, uh, rigging out in style and badassery and challenging the heteropatriarchy wherever you go. So if if you guys want a vest. <laughs> Can I order one? <laughs> so yeah, that's the vest. And if yeah, if you have any more questions about the vest, you can hit me up on the old people Twitter at L I N D K I R S. Thank you. Hi hi. Wow. All right. Um, that was beautiful. Um, I am also part of the Indigenous Feminist Buffalo High Tanners in Alberta Collective. We encourage people to start their own in their in their territories and you know break down oh yes <laughs> Megan as well um, and encourage people to break down the hetero patriarchal settler colonialism in their areas um, uh, we also had another very important question uh, or two questions um, for Melody to kind of answer about um, some of the dialogue around missing and murdered indigenous women um, conversations around uh, two-spirit people as well so I'm going to give the mic back to Melody. Uh, so first of all, uh, Kirsten, if you'd like to put me on uh, the waiting list for a vest as well, that'd be amazing. <laughs> and um, so the first question uh, is, has there been any talk about the role of Two-Spirit people in the government dialogue uh, around missing and murdered Indigenous women? And I think um, given that the, uh, the question uh, specifically frames government dialogue, I think we can... Uh, acknowledge that there's been a, a number of issues around uh, government response or in, uh, indifference uh, as this issue has been really uh, lobbied uh, at the government for a number of years, uh, much longer than like the current attention that it, it, it's uh, uh, is currently seeking. But I would um, first of all like to recenter how we're centering, uh, how we're framing the issue, uh, where the acronym is MMIW, uh, but um, uh, I've been trying to reposition it as MMIWG2S, which would include missing and murdered into just women, girls, and two spirits. Uh, girls, uh, thinking of um, uh, in Winnipeg, where it's youth, uh, young teenagers uh, that are, be are really uh, seeing a lot of violence. And, uh, and, and when we see young girls go missing, when they're Indigenous, often the media starts framing them as women, even if they might be 12, 13 years old and uh, not uh, identified as women. Uh, and in terms of Two-Spirit people, I think our figures are actually even um, lower than reported because... Uh, especially in terms of uh, two-spirited or trans women, often uh, they may they may not have a government-issued ID which matches their gender uh, gender transition because there's uh, a whole series of legal and uh, financial and uh, uh, medical loopholes that trans women uh, trans people are forced to jump through in order for their for their bodies and their identities uh, to be uh, legally and uh, me medically refle reflected. Uh, trans women also um, disproportionately face uh, severe amounts of violence uh, in their day-to-day -day lives, and yet um, there's kind of an ongoing uh, erasure of uh, their particular experiences in terms of uh, when when discussing ag uh, against violence, violence against women. So I would really uh, encourage that we start uh, uh, including trans women in these discussions and talking about these uh, these impacts. Uh, um, that violence against uh, two-spirited and uh, trans trans women face, and um, the second question is: uh, Are there examples of two-spirit and trans solidity with non-indigenous trans and gender non-conforming folks? Uh, uh, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to address that uh, two-spirit uh, is inclusive but broader than uh, than being trans or gender non-conforming. I can think of many two-spirited peers of mine who might say, for example, I'm a gay man, I'm a lesbian woman. Uh, some people, like, it's uh, two-spirit reflects their sexuality, but they, uh, but, uh, they might not see uh, complexity um, or, um, 
or or transition in their gender identity, like gender not conforming would uh, would sort of imply. So Two Spirit is a, a, like a very broad, encompassing framework to situate gen gender and sexual identities, and there is examples of solidarity. Um, uh, uh, for me, in, in some of my arts-based work, I'm currently working as part of a collective called uh, Bold as Love, uh, which is uh, based out of uh, Toronto, and we program a, a music series bringing together um, Indigenous and person of color performing artists with an emphasis on queer and spirited uh, performers. Uh, so this is an ongoing uh, concert series of six uh, six shows. We're actually performing tonight with uh, Lal uh, and uh, and Mo Clark. That's my, uh, my my plug. Why I'm in Toronto, but uh, in terms of art, our arts based programming, like this is an intersection that we're trying to develop because we often do see overlapping issues in our communities. But there's also a lot of issues of appropriation that we struggle with, where uh, a lot of uh, non-Indigenous, gender non-conforming people uh, try uh, to uh, recontextualize Two Spirit as an identity that reflects their own uh, their experiences of uh, of gender diversity. And though uh, these are important experiences uh, to to express for non-indigenous people, like the the by doing that appropriation, they're really erasing a long trajectory of two-spirit indigenous organizing, and a lot of two-spirit and indigenous organizing has happened because we feel excluded from the more mainstream uh, queer or gay uh, uh, gay organizations, and as indigenous people, need to find a space that uh, encompasses the the inter intersections of issues that we face. That's excellent. Uh, that's that's why youth are the experts, um, right there. Uh, I I think I would add to just from the Native Youth Sexual Health Network that um, you know we could have a whole webinar or conversations for years or generations to talk about the ways that um, colonial gender based violence is specifically impacting two spirit people and trans people as well. And you know there's other examples in which are very realistic in day to day. Um, you know that we also have lots of two-spirit youth that are that we're losing to suicide or um, you know lots of um, hard you know just difficult times around self-harm self-injury that are conversations that our communities also need to be talking about more that those are really specific realities that often aren't represented in the statistics around suicide um, but yet we know that we're losing a lot of um, to spirit youth and all the more reason to um, you know take exactly what Melody has shared with us in this webinar um, to heart and to and to action in our community so I know we have a couple more questions here as well uh, oh I think so this one sounds like a social media question for you Kirsten uh, so what aspects of the work do the Instagram youngsters get most excited about what are some of the hot topics in those conversations so maybe you can talk about the role of social media in terms of self-governance for our bodies and our communities uh, Kristen and I know Megan you have lots of thoughts about uh, representation through the media and arts as well so I'm gonna hand it back over to you Kirsten all right uh, well I know that uh, Instagram allows uh, youth to kind of portray like what is going on in their daily life and this really speaks to what Megan was talking about is providing their own media so I'm, I'll let her talk to that but I think like there's especially for uh, youth in rural areas um, there's this idea that it's no longer the rural urban divide that youth are very much connected to networks so uh, whether it's from other rural communities uh, they're adding friends who maybe they haven't met in person, but it's through a, a friend of a friend, and they're adding this through fa Facebook, and they're sharing photos on Instagram. And so, uh, when when they happen to go to the city, they're they're already meeting people that they've met online. So it's this youth kind of networked approach to kind of rural urban, really challenging this rural urban divide. And it it can range to topics like I've I'm not like weird anti, I don't know what they listen to in terms of music, but there's lots of sharing music and, uh, and fashion, and uh, right now in November, the hashtag we are native, um, and so there's a 30-day photo challenge, so it's kind of connecting to the, the Photo Voice project we're working in 
in the school, but then also that they get to speak through their own individual accounts. So they're kind of governing how they want to be portrayed. But I think there's more discussion that can happen around like how how are we accountable uh, to our bodies uh, representing online, just knowing kind of what's out there um, in terms of appropriation that maybe uh, Megan can talk to. Megan? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think what's really interesting about um, looking at social media is that, you know, the concept of borders is a really colonial concept, and with social media, it kind of defies those borders that, you know, we're allowed to be outside of our community, that there's different nations we can connect with. So I, I think that's a really interesting component. But um, in terms of how what youth are really interested in or using social media, and that's important, is that like I was saying, it gives their, it gives them the space to to explore what they are from the comfort of their own home, and it, it, it creates their own space um, to explore that. And for us, what we do over here on top of the cultural appropriation campaign is we've done other social media events, like we've done a um, cultural appropriation scavenger hunt where we created a list of items that were, you know, really offensive, items that could be offensive, items that supported indigenous art, that supported indigenous expression. So it's a really interesting space for youth to just kind of have those conversations and discussions. And like I was saying earlier, through a media that's not always about talking, because youth don't always talk or want to talk or necessarily know how to talk. Um, so. For me, I think that's what's really great about social media. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Kristen and Megan. Um, always doing awesome media arts justice in our communities, and I think that that, that could be even a whole other webinar about uh, the role of media and arts in um, talking about self-governance in our in our communities and for our bodies and responding to harmful representations of us as well. Uh, I just want to thank, um, there's a really important question related back to uh, how our bodies and land are connected um, around self-governance from uh, Lynn and just want to repeat again that, um, you know, I think it was, we had lots of really amazing thoughts shared um, from Alexa and the youth on this panel about how they are specifically impacted as Indigenous young people um, and so just want to center those answers and responses. Uh, we also had a question um, about who are some of our mentors, elders, role models in this work. Um, and so we're going to do a little brag session about all of the super fab people in our lives that have brought us to be here to share with you. So um, Alexa, do you want to start? Um, so in talking about um, who my mentors um, and role models are, well, first of all, like all of the people on the council here, um, Aaron, Kirsten, Ma Melody, and Megan, those are all my role models. Um, and also just um, shout out to like my mom. <laughs> hey mom! <laughs> um, and all of, really essentially all of the um, awesome, amazing um, women in my life who have taught me what it means um, to still like, um, despite being hurt, that we can we can still find love in our lives and we can still love each other and we can still take each other or take care of each other. Um, also acknowledging um, everyone at the network, so all of our staff, youth leaders, um, councils and um, the network, the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, you know, just really teaching me and, and helping me understand that me looking in the mirror and being okay with myself, that that in itself is addressing like colonial gender-based violence, me just being okay with myself and I'm really thankful for those lessons. Awesome. Uh, so uh, mentors, elders, and role models, there's so many. Um, I, think, I think it is the young people first in my life that are my mentors, elders, and role models. Um, you know, I think the land teaches me a lot. Um, we often don't think about the land as being a mentor or a role model, but I think with how much the land puts up in terms of the industry and the, the mistreatment of it, it, it really teaches me a lot about um, strength and resurgence. You know, with a blade of grass being able to po push through concrete, there's a lot to be said about um, what our land does and how it mentors us as well. I mean, there's, there's so many examples. I think um, Christy Belcourt, 
uh, Maria Campbell, Alex Wilson, uh, Louis Esme Cruz, all the indigenous peoples, uh, indigenous peoples in the sex trade and street economies who resist um, state violence and return sovereignty to our bodies every single day. They've taught me some of the best um, teachings of my life that make it so I can survive day to day. Um, and I think I think my family as well. And um, you know, I want to give shout outs to all the two spirit people in my life as well that. Um, have taught me some of the most important lessons as well. Yeah, and um, I also want to acknowledge uh, that Sean Johnston and Alex Wilson are sitting in on the the on on this webinar as well, and both are really uh, two amazing uh, two spirit organizers uh, out of uh, Southern Ontario and uh, Saskatchewan, respectively. Uh, especially uh, that Sean's also from my uh, territory, and I know a number of other uh, two spirit people. Um, originally from Treaty 3 that are working in sort of the eastern and southern Ontario diaspora, like uh, my good friends Howard and Nathan Adler, who are also both artists that I co collaborate extensively, uh, Nadia Quandabins, who's a really amazing photographer, um, and uh, just so many uh, people in my day-to-day -day, uh, day, uh, peer, um, uh, peer groups, because uh, like, we really do uh, uh, look out for each other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Kristen, rock and roll it. All right. Uh, yeah, the the students that I'm working with uh, definitely are my role models right now. I'm learning so much from them. Um, my family letting me crash again uh, in the house uh, is just uh, we have decolonial suppers, decolonial dinners. I guess we cook dinner every other day for e each other, and then we have like a breakdown of like how we can decolonize our family relationships, and then. Um, animals in rural area. I just got a dog, Myla, and she teaches me unconditional love. And I know Erin has met her. And uh, also just animals that have been walking through our yard. I saw a buck yesterday, and I got so excited. I'm like, I saw a deer. And then an eagle. Like, there's no not normally eagles walk through this area. And I, I just got so excited that I started yelling to my family. So just, you know, being excited about about that. And then... I know Maria Campbell has been a great influence on my life. Uh, at the last conference, the Critical Race conference, she said, I'm not romantic about stuff. And I really appreciate that because I think we need to really break down what romantic relationships are doing <laughs> to our other relationships. So I'm going to be breaking down that uh, pretty soon. And then also Lee Miracle, the, her book, Bobby Lee, had really an impact on how this vest was created and that persona of the badass woman and, and, and other ways that we can engage in our community. So those are the, some of the people that are influencing my work right now. So hi, hi. And Megan. Uh, for me, I think like my first role model is, is my mother. She taught me everything that I need to know about who I am and how to respect myself and respect my own boundaries and gave me those first traditional teachings. I really value and honor her for what she's done. Um, but I also want to acknowledge all the elders in my community who are excited to see how youth are, um, I guess, remixing our traditional teachings to make it make sense to them in this modern day and this all these things that are in our lives that weren't in our lives before and to support that and support that exploration. Um, I also want to have a special shout out to um, an elder, Wendy Hill, who's taught me so much about medicine wheel teachings and how to um, heal ourselves in a holistic way and how to acknowledge that you know our emotions and our mental states and our spirits and our bodies are all connected and we can't separate that and how if one is unhealthy, everything is unhealthy and how to address that. Um, also, just all the young mothers that I've I've met um, and how they are working so hard to connect to their children. I I really admire that and and see that there is a lot of disconnect between families and communities because of residential schools and that they're striving now to reconnect that and reconnect their children to the land and bringing them outside to you know listen to the trees and actually talk about how the leaves are dancing. I think is amazing and. My um, my role model right now is my own daughter because she's opening my eyes to to all of these things that I talk about and now I'm living them with her and I'm teaching them with her and experiencing that in a new way that I never experienced. 
All right. We love bragging about all the amazing people in Indigenous communities, like hustling hard, taking care of, taking care of each other, doing what needs to get done. Uh, so we have another question as well. Um, so does the Native Youth Sexual Health Network work in the so-called U.S., um, or are there sister organizations that are doing this organizing work? Um, and I might have missed mentioning this at the beginning, but the Native Youth Sexual Health Network works across Canada and the U.S., and, uh, you know, part of the reason why we do that is because uh, we didn't cross the borders, the borders crossed us, and, you know, at this present period of time, there are borders that cross physically uh, through reservations, through uh, Indigenous communities in our territories, so it really doesn't make sense, uh, at least for us as an organization, not to... Um, uh, not to work across both Canada and the U.S. when, um, you know, there's there's also really uh, specific issues that are affecting in both of those areas. So, you know, HIV being an issue that impacts Indigenous youth both in Canada and the U.S., uh, incarceration, there's so many uh, cross-cutting cutting it, cross -cutting issues um, that need to be addressed across borders. Uh, so we don't, as an organi Indigenous organization, we don't recognize those in our work. We just do the work uh, despite the borders. Um, and so I think unless there's any further questions, uh, we're going to start wrapping up here. Um, we just want to thank everybody for tuning in, for joining uh, us today on this I Don't Know More webinar. We want to thank uh, I Don't Know More folks for supporting our work wholeheartedly. We feel so supported by you um, and for the invitation to come and share about our work um, the space is really important for us to be able to share the stories of um, young people who are on the front lines in their communities, literally um, resisting state violence uh, and doing resurgence and reclamation of our cultures uh, for, for our Indigenous nations. Uh, so just some reminders about how to connect with us. Uh, you can find the National Indigenous Young Women's Council on Twitter at uh, Indigenous YW. You can also find uh, the council on Facebook. They have their own Facebook page, uh, Indigenous Young Women uh, Speaking Our Truths. Oh, Indigenous Young Women. We're pulling up the Facebook page. We're getting it. Um, but you can find it, Indigenous Young Women Speaking Our Truths, Building Our Strengths. Uh, the Native Youth Sexual Health Network is also on Facebook, uh, as well as on Twitter at NYSHN. So, yeah, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. The video will also be archived for viewing later, and we encourage uh, folks to get together, have teach-ins, listen, and discuss about what self-governance means uh, in your communities for your bodies uh, and how that's related to colonial gender-based violence. So we hope that this was a meaningful opportunity uh, to be able to highlight some really amazing uh, Indigenous youth leaders and the work that they're doing and we hope that you also uh, do that in your communities as well. So I want to personally thank um, Alexa for joining, as well as uh, Melody, Megan, and Kirsten for sharing uh, all of their knowledge and brilliance. And um, feel free to tweet at us, and we'll, we'll get back with any other questions as well. Hi, hi.